I suggest, if you don't mind, that we wait for my presentation and then have a global discussion since the topic is just the same. And what I will try to do now is to illustrate what you very brilliantly uh, discussed uh, about distrust in vaccination with the present situation in France. So just to introduce myself, I'm not a specialist in, in vaccination, neither on the biological point of view nor on the societal point of view. I am an immunologist, clinical immunologist working in Paris, I'm interested mostly in uh, immunogenetics, but I was requested by the previous French health minister um, about two years ago uh, to uh, conduct a, a global survey with the juries of citizens and healthcare providers to provide advices how to improve the, the situation about vaccination in France. So that's more or less what I'm going to, to discuss with you to present now um, during my talk. If I can have my slides, what should I do to get my slides? Can you help me? Thank you. So the title of my talk is something like that, the public health policy for vaccination, persuasion, or coercion. And that's how we discuss. I like this cartoon, which actually is a cartoon from China, dated of 1952, of course, as a way to try to promote vaccination in China at that time. Uh, okay, just a, a very short story about the development of vaccination. So, starting uh, with, at the end of the 18th century, and of course, most of the developments occurred during the 20th century. And in blue, I uh, uh, emphasized vaccines or techniques of vaccinations that are at discussion now in France, as, as you will see, and probably for at least some of you are aware of, starting with diphtheria and tetanus vaccines, the usage of these famous aluminum-based adjuvants that uh, some of the French people don't like, <coughs> uh, polymyelitis, pertussis, the flu, the multival development of multiple multivalent vaccines that are at stake again in France these days, and then more recently, more recently measles, hepatitis B, meningitis, we heard about recent development, and finally for the vaccines that are presently available, the papillomavirus, another important issue in terms of vaccination. Um, I did wrong. All right. So it is estimated that vaccination saves uh, many, many lives every year, everywhere in the world. So one of the estimations of the WHO is that it's around 2.5 million lives that are saved every year by the program of vaccination as they are developed. Not, ex not fully yet, as you know, uh, but as they are developed these days. And there are evidences for <coughs> uh, the, the fact that vaccination save lives are multiple, and I will remind you a few of them with particularly discussing a few of the French data. But of course, this is based on the fact that vaccination uh, acts individually, but also protects other people, vulnerable people, and it led to eradication of smallpox and disparition and disappearance in many countries, unfortunately not everywhere, of diphtheria and polio. And these are some data, it, that's classical data from the US, where the number of cases of polio, pertussis, measles, and so on, went down from these figures to those ones once vaccination programs have developed. This is one example of data. <coughs> Here are a few other examples from France. These are statistics from the uh, uh, health public health agency of France. This is the data for Haemophilus influenzae B. So vaccination was initiated here. From here I can read. I don't remember the exact, so it's, it was uh, 1992. Uh -huh. And as you can, <coughs> as you can see, uh, virtually all cases of um, uh, severe hemophilus influenza B infections have been uh, prevented by the development of this vaccination program, which works well in France. The few, <coughs> excuse me, remaining cases uh, have occurred in, in patients who have not been vaccinated. Um, data about pertussis, same story. So vaccination was introduced somewhere here. <coughs> excuse me, in the 60s, and uh, most of pertussis cases have disappeared, though there are still a few, we still a few deaths, uh, because of um, uh, some holes in vaccination programs. For the old same story, uh, following the introduction, sorry, perhaps. 
following the introduction of uh, the inactivated and the oral vaccine, uh, polio has disappeared. I mean, endogenous cases of polio have disappeared of France as from most of um, countries, of all countries of Western Europe, for instance. Okay, uh, another study I like, which I think was done very, very cautiously, is a Dutch study where they analyzed retrospectively uh, the, uh, the death for, from uh, the very strong epidemiological data they have from these diseases that are, can be prevented by vaccination for diphtheria, pertussis, tetanus, polio, and measles, um, with the date of introduction of vaccination in, in the Netherlands. So there is a global estimation, which is a minimal estimation, but a very strong one, very based on very solid facts, that at least 9,000 lives were saved uh, by the introduction of this vaccine in, in Holland, uh, including 147,000 um, uh, years of life. So this looks quite small figures, but I think at least the advantage of that study it has been, it, uh, is the fact that it has been done in a very, very rigorous manner, so that these figures cannot be debated. So they are very strong in terms of evidences for the protection provided by vaccination. Okay, but okay, we know we are all convinced here, I guess, that vaccination works, but these advances are quite fragile. This has already been discussed uh, by the, the previous speaker, but a few things, especially in the French context these days. If we look at uh, vaccination against um, men C, here are the figures in France today. Uh, th this vaccination is recommended uh, in, during the two, two shots during the first two years of life. But as you can see, uh, the figures in France are not good at all. Only 70% of children at the age of two have been fully vaccinated. And the program to try uh, to vaccinate those who have not been vaccinated early enough are, are don't work at all since young adults are not vaccinated at all. So the consequence is that Unlike what is occurring, for instance, in UK or in Holland, where the introduction of vaccination against men C led to a disappearance, these are the UK figures, of uh, these uh, mean, form of meningitis in France, we still have cases. There, is, there has been no improvement at all in terms of protection against meningitis caused by men C. Uh, for instance, over the last years, it's approximately 120 cases that have occurred every year, despite the fact that vaccination has been introduced here. So it's a failure. Having only 70% of the young children uh, protected and uh, very few of older children leads to an absence of global protection against these meningitis in France, unfortunately. If we move to <coughs> uh, measles, rubella, and mumps, the, the rate of vaccination, the, of the full vaccination in France, is only 79%. And again, this has been associated over the last years uh, to an epidemic. During the years 2008 to 2012, there has been at least 25,000 cases of measles uh, declared in France, with uh, quite a number of uh, people being hospitalized with severe pneumonitis, encephalitis, and deaths. Actually, if we count this up to 2017, there are 20 deaths from measles that could have been protected by vaccination. Many of them occur, in, by the way, in immunodeficient patients who could not be directly protected by vaccination. So they were relying on the people with whom they are living. OK, if we move uh, further, uh, now we look to pertussis. Uh, and hepatitis, hepatitis. Oops, again. <coughs> okay. Um, so the, the, the rate of uh, boost vaccination for pertussis at the age of 15 is only 70% in France, which is, of course, not enough. And for hepatitis B, the rate of, of people vaccinated at the age of 15 years is only 43%, so at the age where the contamination starts. So, of course, this is not a good situation. And we can even go further, considering people who are immunocompromised, who require further vaccination with, against Streptococcus pneumoniae, the rate of vaccination is only approximately 30%, which is very low. And there are even worse, there has been over the last years a decrease in the rates of vaccination against HPV, which is just a complete failure in France. It started at approximately 28 
28% of uh, um, <coughs> girls at the age of 16 being vaccinated in two, two, uh, 2010. Now it's down to 16%. And uh, same with seasonal flu, where the rate of vaccination is also going down a little bit. Uh, just to illustrate this about HPV, this is the map of France with the rate of vaccination as a function of, of regions. There are some heterogeneity, which is, by the way, extremely interesting because it, it is uh, found to be parallel to failures of vaccinations with other vaccines. For instance, in the south uh, east <coughs> of France, this is the place where vaccination is the less uh, implemented. And also, this is the place, for instance, where uh, GPs, or so general practitioners, are the less frequently convinced about vaccination. So this is quite strongly correlated. So it's a failure in France, whereas, for instance, in UK, it works. More than 80% of girls in UK are vaccinated, mostly at school, uh, against HPV. Uh, so there is this trust, I will discuss that now, about vaccination in France. But of course, it didn't start in France. Well, it started in France, but it started everywhere. It started with Jenner. You, you mentioned that. And this is a famous cartoon of the time of Jenner, where he is shown to, uh, when he's was vaccinating people to induce them to have uh, now uh, a face um, who is like a, looking like a cow, for instance, as shown here. And of course, this is uh, still ongoing with Trump. We, you already showed this, um, this tweet. It's not 2016, it's 14, but it doesn't matter. And so it's a problem, and it's a problem particularly in France, as you will see uh, now from some figures. So vaccination distrust in France. There has been a number of studies, of population studies, to, uh, to try to assess how important is the distrust, how uh, is it uh, covering all kinds of vaccines, or some of them. So the, the most, probably the best study that has been performed was, uh, was done last year and the data were made public recently which shows and i will give you in more details that approximately 25 uh, percent of the population of in france this day has doubts about either safety efficacy of vaccines or both uh, this is shown here in more details so the same questions were asked to people not the same people but the, the, to, to um, uh, some people uh, or, time after time, from 2000, 2000, 2000 up to now. So in blue, here are the people who are in favor of vaccination. Pale blue, those who are rather in favor, but not fully in favor. In pink, those who are rather against. So they, they like some vaccines, but they don't like others, like hepatitis B, for instance. And in red are those who are really against. So you see, with the, with the exception of 2010, I will come back to it, from 2000, to 2016, uh, the slope is not going into the best possible direction since in 2000 there were only approximately uh, between 8 and 9 percent of people in France who had rather negative feelings or uh, behaviors about vaccination, at least feelings, not, not mm. sorry, this is the other way, uh, and this is now uh, up to 25% approximately. And there was a peak in distrust in 2010, and this was clearly following the crisis we had in France following the H1N1 pandemics, and the way it was handled by the French government when they decided that everyone should be vaccinated, but and that the vaccination would be implemented by the army, and, and that the, the doctors, the GPs were put aside of the vaccination program, and this created a, a very strong um, resentment against such decision and, and distrust against health authorities in France. So things went a little bit better afterwards, but still the global slope goes into the wrong direction uh, in terms of confidence to vaccination. Uh, looking further, if we <coughs> consider, we consider the, the healthcare providers and like the general practitioners, the doctors. So if the question, oh, I'm sorry, I'm not good at handling this thing. So when the question is asked, if for the DTP vaccine, so diphtheria totanus polio, that was uh, uh, mandatory up to now in France, uh, if the, the mandatory status would be abundant, what would you do? A bit more than 15% of doctors would not insist anymore on the importance of vaccination. 
The, the same figures were obtained in surveys performed in 2007 and 2015. And of course, those GPs play a major role uh, because this is, these are the first uh, line of uh, information that people get about vaccine. Uh, even worse, perhaps, or at least as important, is the recent observation, uh, and I will show you the figure in a, in a, in a small, uh, in a, on the next slide, that 13% of parents at the age of having children, between 20 and 40, say, will deny vaccination of their children against DTP if the mandatory status of this vaccine would be abandoned. That was the result of a, of a survey performed a few months ago in, in France, and this is shown here. So to that question, as you can see, half of them, or a bit more than that, 55% would say they will still accept vaccination, but 31% would say yes, likely, so they are not fully sure, and 9% uh, would say no, probably not, we are not going to, vaccine, to accept the vaccination against DTP of our of child and no 4%. So of course this is a little bit worrying. All right, so the perception obviously of vaccination in France is uh, disbalanced with uh, the loss of uh, the, uh, the benefits. They are quite unknown and as you actually, uh, uh, um, that's something you alluded to, uh, this is clearly a way that uh, by psychological consideration, the w when you don't trust in it, you don't consider something to be useful, then you consider it not only to be useful, but also uh, to be potentially harmful. So then you consider that risks as associated with a given practice, in that case vaccination, uh, are much more than uh, in that they are in reality. And in France, uh, in particularly the, the potential uh, alleged risk associated with the usage of aluminum salts has been put forward. So this is the, the, the situation. So with, with the, the overall figures I already mentioned, sorry about that, here, but I will not reiterate what I already told you. This is not the case everywhere. If we look around us, let's consider, just consider UK. Uh, this is a poster from uh, the UK health care authorities, but we chose that was from 2016, that 94% of parents are confident in vaccination and accept their children to receive all of the vaccines that are recommended during the first years of life and later. So the situation is not equal in the world and France unfortunately is really in bad shape in terms of vaccination these days. So uh, among the committee I have been working with, with a number of uh, social scientists, we try to analyze the many reasons that are uh, the causes of this distrust. Of course, this is very complex. This was very well uh, discussed before me. But I will review briefly what, the, what are the factors we consider to be involved in this distrust, even if this is a relative distrust, of course. Uh, among sociological factors, there again, uh, obviously, is the fact mm. This is terrible. Uh, that there is today a reduced awareness uh, of infectious diseases because of vaccination success. Of course, this is the paradox, but this is the reality. And on the other way, there are fears about adjuvants and uh, leading to just distrust in hepatitis B and HPV vaccines, for instance. Uh, then we have the fact that in France we have this very special, very specific situation where some of the vaccines uh, that are used in young children were uh, mandatory, like DTP, diphtheria, tetanus, polio, whereas the all others, uh, Haemophilus B, meningococcus, and so on, they were only recommended. And many people consider that everything, if something is only recommended, it means that you are not. Well, if you want to do it, you do it, but this is not that important. So that this, uh, the, this perception is, is pretty strong. Uh, then uh, there is, and this has been repeatedly mentioned by uh, GPs, by doctors, that there are difficulties to convince people, to those who are hesitant. They are, the difficulties may come from the time that they, from the fact, excuse me, that they don't have enough time to convince people, or sometimes they feel uneasy themselves to convince the people. They don't have the right arguments uh, to convince people and to restore confidence. And also, globally speaking, there is a growing wish in the population for more autonomous decisions, I would say globally speaking, but particularly in the context of healthcare. Then there are factual factors, and some of them are specific to France. 
some, for instance, some difficulties in vaccines procurement. And of course, this is causing suspicion that this is organized on purpose. And of course, uh, this is typically uh, how a plot uh, can uh, start about uh, vaccination. But, uh, uh, the, the way people, uh, if, if you want to be vaccinated, first you have to go to the doctor, and then you, you will go to the pharmacist and come back to the doctor to be vaccinated. This is much too complicated. And some people actually are not hesitant. They just don't, they do not vaccinate themselves or the children because they don't want to go uh, to the doctor, then to the pharmacist, then to the doctor again. This is too complicated. This has to be simplified. So this is not psychology. This should be easy to implement. Uh, to, to modify. Uh, there is a lack, people don't know about the vaccination status, that's absolutely clear, especially in adults. Uh, some of the vaccines are quite uh, costly, this is the case of HPV, and in some cases it could be a problem. And then there are context contextual aspects of that lead to distrust. Uh, in France, there is a distrust generated by several health crises that occurred over the last 20 to, to 30 years uh, uh, from some drug, and I'm not going into details, but we know that people in France have little trust in health authorities in, as well as in industry uh, associated with vaccine, like actually not only those associated with vaccine, but associated with all of the production of, of, of the medics, unfortunately. Uh, some uh, decision by the justice we are also pro causing problems since there have been a few cases, and uh, recently another one in France, where compensation obtained by people who had multiple sclerosis that occurred following vaccination uh, against hepatitis B. Uh, so they received compensation despite the lack of evidence of causal relationship. But of course, if such an information is distributed into the general population say, well, if there is compensation, it means that there is, a, there is a causal relationship. And this is a problem, of course. Uh, then there is the diffusion of uh, negative comments or opinions about vaccinations. There has been a study by uh, some uh, sociologists working in Marseille, in France, uh, Pierre Verger. They have identified 17 uh, French-speaking websites that are diffusing negative information about vaccine. 17, so it's quite a lot. And in, fa in face of these informations that have grown up over the last 20, 30 years on, the, on the, the websites and some of the media, there has been very little response of health authorities and very little response more, uh, world, uh, more widely of the medical community and the scientific community uh, to these uh, fake news. And globally, I may add that uh, it is, is clear that compared for, to the north of Europe, for instance, there is a very poor culture of culture, excuse me, of prevention among the healthcare providers uh, in terms of prevention. Okay, so this trust, unfortunately, is promoted by politicians. We already heard about Trump, and by the way, the response to Trump has already, I will not go further, but in France, again, if we consider the last presidential election that took place one year ago, among the many candidates, there were four, which is quite enough, sorry, four of them, uh, including two of the extreme right, that clearly spoke against vaccination. So vaccination became a political issue, which is just unbelievable, but this is the case. And recently, as I will discuss in a second, as you may know, uh, there has been a vote by the French Parliament to extend the mandatory status of vaccination. But mem uh, members of parliaments from three parties, from the extremes, have voted against it. Again, so it's a, there is a now a clear, now poly, vaccination has become a political issue in France, as it is the case in, in, to some extent in the US, but in France it's now absolutely clear, whereas in most of these other European countries, with the exception of Italy, which is very, where the situation is very similar to the situation in France, this is not the case. Vaccination is not a political issue. And in the media, in including in media that are supposed to be the most respectful ones, just one, two examples from the Le Monde, from Le Monde, which is supposed to be the most intellectual journal uh, newspaper in France. This is a, a cartoon, an interesting one, that appeared uh, in December of 2016. And this cartoon was associated with two, um, two papers that were uh, 
mentioning potential negative effects of vaccines, especially of HPV. And you can see here what is shown. This guy who's supposed to be a doctor, I guess, has a syringe which look like, looks like a, a, I don't know, kind of weapon that is going to attack uh, this beautiful, uh, a papillon. Butterfly. butterfly, thank you. This beautiful butterfly is going to be probably uh, to, go, to be uh, harmed by this syringe and what is supposed to be a vaccine. And the very same newspaper, more recently, so this is October 2017, uh, in one of the booklets of, of, the, of the journal that appeared on a Saturday, uh, there is a long, very long paper where they are discussing problems in healthcare. And if you may read, this is in French, vaccines, uh, healthcare scandals, uh, disinformation, distrust of the French people of, uh, to, toward the medical uh, community and pharmaceutical industry is growing up. So they put together everything and vaccines, the term vaccine itself uh, has a negative connotation. And here again there is a, uh, a, f a picture of a little girl who was vaccinated some time ago but they added this snake and obviously the snake has is not very sympathetic to this girl. So this is how the world may represent vaccination these days, which I think is a problem. And I, I agree we have to, to uh, fight against and to, uh, to write papers and to try to, to convince them not to continue such campaigns. So in that context, uh, which became more and more uh, worrying, there, are, there has been a report from an MP in France in early 2016 suggesting a few actions and the, the Ministry of Health at that time, Madame Touraine, wanted to have a court of concertation, concertation citoyenne so we, with a strategic committee I, I was the head of, with the idea that by having juries of lay people and healthcare providers but not specialized in vaccination and those people being uh, informed and then developing their own uh, judgments based on uh, having uh, interviews with uh, anyone they, they, they wanted to, to hear, uh, that this may be a way to be kind of mediation between the voice of experts and the voice of the population that was, uh, uh, of course, influenced by uh, the, the, the negative views on vaccination. So there, in, in addition to the, the work of the, these two juries who worked for six full days uh, in the summer of 2016, there were other more classical ways of getting information on, on vaccination. And at the end, it's the, the, the end product was to produce recommendations based on two questions that were uh, asked by the ministry, how to improve trust in vaccines, how to improve vaccination rates. That's ob the obvious questions. So the, maybe we can uh, figure it that way. So the, the distrust, as observed in France and in some other countries, uh, starts with uh, um, under evaluation of benefits and, up, uh, and uh, increase in overestimation <coughs> of risks. And we want to go uh, back or to, to a better situation where the, the, the balance is, in, is um, uh, going into the other direction. So of course it requires lots of efforts and the question we have which is we are facing these days in France how long this is going to take and what should be done of course. So a number of recommendations were, were made. Some of them are of course in terms of persuasion education but then came the question of should we be coercive about vaccination. So briefly, uh, it was recognized by everyone, but that was not obvious at the very beginning. By everyone, by everyone I mean the members of the juries who uh, were a able to work on vaccination for, for several days. So they concluded, fortunately, that vaccination is imperative and indispensable, both for an individual and altruistic protection, for the obvious reasons we know and that there is, was a need for a strong and long-lasting commitment of health authorities to promote vaccination. So it was a good starting point, but of course this is not enough. So the recommendations were to increase transparency of all of the experts involved in vaccination and increase also access to, to, to transparency of that, data access about vaccination, but of course then to make a very strong effort about information, education, communication, so that's back to what was discussed by 
the, the previous speaker. In, for instance, it included, among many other actions, to design a website dedicated to both lay people and healthcare providers. This, is in part, has been implemented now, but of course, this is not sufficient. Uh, to increase education at school, university, and so on about vaccination, to simplify the vaccination process in terms of ex accessibility. Uh, this is terrible. In terms of accessibility, uh, to have the possibility to, ba to be vaccinated at school, which is no longer the case in France. It was the case 40, 50 years ago. It's no longer the case. Uh, at workplaces, in pharmacies, and so on. This, this can be implemented quite easily, actually. Uh, to, uh, to develop electronic recording about vaccination for the follow-up of people, to uh, take care of disponibility of vaccine, and also to uh, improve the training of healthcare providers about vaccination. And finally, to promote research, but not only in biology, but also in terms of social sciences, to assess uh, this distrust and, how, and to develop and to test ways of uh, better convince people to accept vaccination. And then, then we come to the hard core, which is what to be done in terms of the status of the vaccine. So the, the, uh, it, up to now in France, for the young children, three vaccines were mandatory for since a very long time, more than 50 years ago. It were diphtheria, tetanus, and polio. And all others, which are eight, practically in France, were only recommended. And uh, as I mentioned, this status is not understood by people, and it created a lot of, uh, per se, uh, of uh, uncertainties and hesitation for the so-called recommended vaccines that were considered not being as important as the other ones. So from that, there were two possibilities, either uh, to suspend completely, uh, to to have all of the vaccines recommended, no longer to have any mandatory vaccine, or to transiently, <coughs> for the time being during which this trust is as strong as it is in France, to have the, all of the vaccines, the three plus eight, the 11 make mandatory for uh, the, the, the children below the, the age of two. So after a lot of discussion, it was proposed to the, the ministry to go for a coercitive recommendation, uh, that is to have a transient extension of the mandatory status to all of the pediatric vaccines, so L11 all together, those who, that were so far recommended in France, for children below the, the age of two, and, uh, which was considered as being a compromise between public health requirements and acceptability, although it is not obvious that this would be fully accepted, we will see in the, in the next uh, months and years in France, but it was considered that the risk of having to, to observe a further decrease in vaccination rates in France based on the, uh, the studies that were performed, the, the surveys that were performed, especially in young adults, that the risk was too high to accept to take the risk in France, with the French situation, I'm not going to say this is what should be implemented in every single country, the risk was too high to accept that vaccines would be only recommended. Um, with the idea that hope, hoping that all of the other measures in terms of uh, education will be strong enough, of course requiring some time, but that after some time it will be possible to release the obligation and go back to a situation which is of course much more satisfactory that uh, vaccination is understood and that people are adhering to the program of vaccination without a, a need for obligation. But that may require some years. We don't know today. <coughs> so, uh, by the way, we, it was also recommended that vaccines should be fully covered in terms of costs, something that has not been fully adopted by the present government in France. Uh, this is a pity, to my opinion, that there still could be compensation for adverse events. This should be maintained, despite that the likelihood of connection between um, the vaccine and the event is not fully demonstrated by far, and that vaccines procurement uh, issues have to be solved. 
Okay, uh, further recommendation for, for uh, we are made for HPV vaccination and for vaccination in adults. I will not go into the details, but we should not forget that, of course, vaccination of young children is not all of vaccines. <laughs> and actually, the problems in terms of rate of vaccination in France are even worse if we consider vaccinations in adults. And uh, as I mentioned, this is also not satisfactory for vaccination against HPV. And we really have to do something to promote this vaccination in France. But I will not go now into the details about it. So what's next? Actually, something happened that is not exactly the same as the letter that many, many medical societies and other societies sent to Trump in February 2017. But many uh, medical societies and groups of people and groups of patients actually have supported these recommendations. For instance, there was a, a communique de presse or um, a press uh, release. Uh, that uh, was originated initially from 30 uh, uh, medical societies in France that were supporting this recommendation. And further, this was also, you, you can't read, but many, many other groups did it, and this was made public. Uh, but inter interestingly enough, and sadly enough, many medias didn't talk about these, uh, um, these uh, public statements from many, many people from the healthcare world, as well as from uh, the lay population, so which is or which was a problem too. Um, but actually, the response of, reco of uh, the recommendation, as you may know, is that uh, the, the present health minister has endorsed most of the recommendations, and that the, the mandatory um, status of the pediatric vaccines has been voted by the parliament, despite some opposition, as I mentioned. Uh, last fall, and they are now in place since this month. And of course, the next month will be critical to see how it is going to be implemented, whether there will be an opposition or whether people, most of the people will, jump, will follow uh, the, what is now uh, required for every single child. Of course, there is still the question that is raised everywhere, including in the scientific world. That's why I put in it again. So if you make vaccinations uh, mandatory, could be considered as a bridge to individual freedom of decision uh, in healthcare. And that's, of course, a question that, can be, that should be addressed. But I think the answer to me is pretty simple. It is based on something that everyone is aware of. That is, if you vaccine children, not only you, you protect them um, well, but also you protect those who are not vaccinated, not yet vaccinated, because they don't have yet the right age, for instance. And you, don't, you for instance, the, the infants, and this is important for pertussis uh, and some of the meningitis, you have to, you, vaccination is required to protect those who do not benefit from vaccination, who are immunodeficient for several reasons, and as well as elderly people. So vaccination is a, is a collective behavior and should be treated as such. And in that context, coercion may be considered acceptable. Of course, this is open for debate. But th this is the position that has been taken by our committee and endorsed by the present government. So the conclusion is that uh, there is a need that apparently it is the case today in France for a new impetus in favor of health policy for vaccination, knowing that during 30 years nothing happened. But negative comments in the, in the, uh, on the web, that's the only thing we've heard in France about vaccination. So attention to our questions and doubts is extremely important. You will emphasize that, and I will certainly <laughs> uh, go with you on, on this idea. There is a need for a mobilization of decision makers together with stakeholders to implement now these recommendations and, and the law. And there is, of course, a strong expectation for many people uh, mostly within the healthcare provider population, but also in, in the patient association. So, for instance, people with chronic diseases are extremely worried about the fact that they don't get vaccination well enough, and many, many other people. And um, so, my conclusion would be the question is for me not persuasion or correction, but perhaps in some circumstances, such as the one we are, we are in France these days, they may come together for some time. And of course, this will be need to be evaluated in terms of outcome over the next years, uh, based on the new program developed in France. 
Okay, I will finish here just with a few acknowledgements about this concertation citoyenne to thank those who have been working uh, to uh, provide uh, the uh, final recommendations. Thank you very much. <laughs> if you don't mind, you may come with me so that we may answer the questions. There are already several questions, uh, perhaps. Yes, I would just like to know in this room how many people are vaccinated against the flu this year. <laughs> so how many are not? <laughs> Thank you, that's good. Not convinced how you could help this general population. Absolutely. And if you ask the same question in, in a community of healthcare providers, but here there are also scientists, uh, the proportion is more or less the same, so I fully agree with you. Do you want to comment? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, who else? Yes, please. How come it's easier to get an education, a continuing education in uh, medical faculty or university in France? about homeopathic rather than vaccination? <laughs> uh, that's the answer for France. <laughs> well, it's not exactly that. I mean, it, this is a little bit of uh, an overstatement. But unfortunately, it is true since I think, well, I will not give the name of the minister who, who did it, but uh, since a bit more than 20 years, it's possible to get education about homeopathy during medical school, at medical school. This is true, unfortunately. Um, but still, there is education about vaccination. It's not good enough, especially the, the healthcare providers in France are not trained uh, to be able to give, a, say that, to, to, to give the right message to properly uh, answer questions about vaccination. So they, they get the theoretical training, but not much of the practical training in terms of how to interact. And this can be certainly improved, but so there is room for improvement, but it's not there. <laughs> Perhaps I could make a comment on that, sure. in terms of uh, how they answer the questions, but you also referred to how they interact, and so um, based on what I showed you today, and on research as well, that conversation between a healthcare professional and someone who has questions around vaccination, first of all, is pivotal in their decision pathway, and secondly, it's probably more about the how than the what. How they manage that conversation rather than the actual content and their responses to the question. So I didn't show the slides because I ran out of time, but we're developing a program with a professor of communication who's been working for 30 years in global health on an approach to communication that is all about the how. And in that approach, what we say over and over again is build trust, build trust, build trust. <coughs> It's not about answering the questions. Of course, you must answer questions that people have, but it must be all about creating that connection with people, um, listening to them for a while, understanding their position, uh, mirroring back to them what they say so that they feel heard, but so that they feel felt, and then people are more open to new ideas. Any yeah. other questions? I'm sorry, but I'm very convinced. As a mother of several children, I've never seen any uh, medical practitioner uh, recommend vaccination when they were more than eight, 10 years old. And <coughs> that's a problem. Yeah, yeah sure. That, that, absolutely. This is clear that the, the doctors are not aware well enough of the importance of vaccination. So of course I, I fully agree with you about uh, the, the fact that they need to to develop the, the, the response as a trust to, to the doctors, but also they have to know. They, they, they lack some knowledge about what, what they have to, uh, to do. So, there is, so today, actually, the um, directors of the medical schools in France are working on developing a specific program about vaccination for, for MDs, but this is not enough. That this will be done also for in nursing school as well for, uh, in schools for midwives and, and pharmacists. And then there is the idea of something which is not working well in France is uh, professional education once you are in the professional life. And uh, there is a lot to do in terms of vaccination. Not only in terms of vaccination, but there is a lot to do there. There's a clear. 
Do you want the, the mic? Yes, I can hear you. So I really enjoyed this conversation. So I come from Texas. I'm a local here, which is uh, someone who he lives trying to raise awareness about this. In fact, I just texted him and he said he wanted to we had a chat with you. But I just wanted to um, bring a couple of, of things, right? And I think the new generation, the, the young generations, uh, we don't really get trained, and certainly we didn't, uh, of how to really do this public engagement. It's a different generation. But I see um, that the institution, especially at the academic institution, we don't do a really good job at incentivizing this community engagement and public engagement. Right? So I'm actually right now um, participating in a fellowship uh, put together by the American Association for Advancement of Science, the AAAS, to really try to bridge and bring curriculum within academic institutions to integrate science public engagement with you. Because we are really good at talking to ourselves. And we do, of course, I'm really good at talking about publishing. But we don't translate that research scientific information into a language, like you said, of how to communicate with the, with the real people, right? So I really wanted to hear your, your thoughts of how we academics building you know, programs, master's programs, PhD programs, how can we really incentivize our institutions to allow us to integrate public engagement? And because it's a, it's a trained art, not everybody can really speak um, like you do or like your hotels do. I, I don't think I can even do it myself. It's really a very interesting art of uh, this whole concept. So I want to hear from so I, th I think you touch upon an important point, which is going beyond training healthcare professionals to communicate better with their patients, training scientists to communicate better full stop. And um, my personal view is that this post-fact world, whatever you want to call it, this loss of trust in science, is an existential threat to humanity. If we don't get this right, we're going to be in trouble. This is touching issues like vaccination, but also climate change, etc. So we have to get it right. And to get it right, scientists have to learn how to communicate what they do, why they do it, and how the scientific method works. Because, you know, when I started working in a lab, I didn't believe the scientific method either. My gels showed me this, but I didn't believe there was DNA there until they continually, continuously showed me the same thing. And all of a sudden, I mean, you know, the scientific method uh, takes training, and it needs to be explained to people. Um, how do you incentivize organizations um, to train their students? That, that, that's a tricky question. I know there are a couple of organizations uh, doing great work. What's the organization that Alan Alder leads doing great work around um, you know, public engagement and science? The Wellcome Trust does great work as well. Um, I don't have the answer to that, but at some point, I think that scientific institutions um, have to take responsibility for this um, existential threat that is rapidly emerging, which is if people don't believe science and if people are allowed to ignore science and if policy decisions are made on truthiness and not truth, um, we're going to be in real trouble. But I would strongly support the idea of training scientists to communicate as well. And this is, when we're talking about communication, this is, this is um, you know, it's the same thing that we're talking about with healthcare professionals. There's the what. And that's important, but I would argue that for healthcare professionals talking about vaccination, uh, getting the what right, the answers to people's questions, is more reassuring for the healthcare professional than for the person. What the person wants is to feel heard or to feel felt. And once they feel that, they're probably going to listen to the rest of what they have to say. Um, of course, you still have to get the answers right. You have to get the answers right in the language that people speak. <laughs> that's, that's one of the huge errors that we've made in vaccination. Um, but the answer to that, I don't have. But uh, I, think it, I think it would be interesting to seek out models, um, to find uh, faculties who are doing this, not only in medicine, um, but in science as well, in biological sciences, and see if that model can be replicated. I have a question about the mandatory vaccines. It's obvious that it's, it's a good one, 
that it's going to reduce the disease burden. However, I think, like you said, we are forcing people to do things that some people don't like. What other strategy would you advise the government to use? Would you say they should stick to this strategy of communicating or forcing people to take the vaccines? Or would you approach it the same way we do trust, the trust thing? What would you advise? No, clearly the advice, and I hope it has been uh, heard and from what the minister says these days, it is that this program of mandatory vaccine has to be, and this is absolutely clear, has to be associated with very strong campaign in terms of communication, information, at all possible levels in the society to promote vaccination. This is not just something which is obligatory and then we, we don't talk about it. We have to, ex it has to be explained everywhere, every day, uh, and uh, that this should be a quite an engagement uh, of, of many, many people. So it's, it may be that way. I mean, at least it has been understood that way. So of course, it, it, behind words, we need the uh, facts and we will see. But the idea is, is to do it, uh, to coordinate uh, the obligation with uh, many, several, many programs of information, education, and communication. I'm not, I'm not in a position to comment because it's up to have public health authorities, the governments, to make that decision. But if mandates are in place, um, I think as as you commented, no, it's okay to when I was holding it. Um, I think uh, it's important to communicate on that. It's important that people understand why it's in place. It's important to hit a Goldilocks zone between um, allowing people to, you know, to have their personal choice, but making that very, very difficult. Um, we saw a number of recommendations that I think make a lot of sense around how to make mandatory vaccination work. But fundamentally, it's how you communicate it to the population and help people understand why that's in place. Uh, yeah, so. I come from Brazil and we have a calendar for vaccines from the young, the, the, the booster and all that. But I've been here mothers say, oh, my kids, they are not vaccinated with MMR or GPT, and they don't get uh, sick. So I don't think I need to vaccinate them. And in the school, people are saying the same. And when I try to explain, they don't get sick because mine are vaccinated neighbors are vaccinated and we make like a barrier against the pathogen and she said oh people tend to say that but i don't believe it so it, it's really hard to 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 explain to these people how important is to vaccinate it, how they kept ebola you know just in in, in, in uh, in a region mm. without spread, but so it's. I think it's very hard how we can do that. Mm. It, it's hard, but um, it has to be done. I think you know you need to listen to people and understand the position. Um, I mean, I lead the editorial board of a large uh, website on vaccination, and the most um, accessed uh, content on our site uh, is a story of a father who lost his um, child to measles complications, and uh, an animation on herd immunity. A very simple animation on herd immunity that's the most accessed on a site that has hundreds and hundreds of pieces of content. Um, that's one thing. Um, I mean, you need to think about how you respond to these questions. Uh, when I was young, uh, we drove all the time without seatbelts and I didn't have an accent. Um, you know, uh, I, I don't put fire detectors and I haven't had a fire. Uh, you know, what, are the, what, is the, what, are, what is the thing that will click, that, that will, you know, have that impact in people, that help them see things differently? Um, I mean, I've heard that, I've heard that from people. Um, my child's protected, so my child's unvaccinated. Um, I don't care. My response to that is that it's a good decision. I mean, it's a good decision if, you know, because you're taking zero risk and your child's protected. That, that, that makes sense, right? But, you know, if you're entourage, if your community, if people that you know are making the same good decision <laughs> to not vaccinate their children, suddenly it's not a good decision. Yeah. You know, there are, there are different ways of coming at this. Um, and the key is to understand the person's position and to try to come up with ways that will help them see things differently, is the way I approach things. 
Did you have a question? Yeah, a general question, because oh. if I'm wrong, I'll the pigats, the pigats are supposed to vaccinate their very young people before two years of age. Is this population more well trained regarding the, the way to convince the parents and the, at a social level and scientific level? The question is, are pediatricians who vaccinate more better trained at managing that conversation? Well, I can give the answer for France. Uh, the answer is yes. The, the very uh, vast majority of pediatricians in France are convinced, are quite active in uh, conv convincing uh, parents or having their, their children vaccinated. The problem is that there are not so many pediatricians. And uh, more than half of the population uh, never goes to a pediatrician. I think there's also an interest in providing skills uh, for that conversation that can be used in other conversations within a, a daily clinical practice. And uh, I mean, there are a number of approaches that have been taken to, to, to how to manage that conversation using approaches like motivational interviewing or the AIMS method that we have. I think what's important is, in particular, healthcare professionals who are not doing, who are not vaccinating all day, every day, to provide them the skills with the convers for that conversation that they could have in other conversations with their patients around prevention, et cetera, et cetera. Because um, essentially, the science shows us, one, that communication is, is bioactive. Communication doesn't just have an impact. It, this is not just message transmission. Right? When I'm communicating to you, there's all sorts of stuff going on. I'm, I'm actually having an impact on, on your physiology, on your psychology. I mean, I can, you know, I can reshape neural pathways through the way that I communicate. This is science. Science shows us this. So communication is a tool for healthcare professionals. It's a tool that they could use to, to have an impact on health outcomes in their patients. Uh, what do you think that would be the scenario in France in five years, for example? <laughs> <laughs> and we will invite you again in five years. <laughs> <laughs> so, and this is what you start, you know? <laughs> this is a scientific meeting, not a problem. <laughs> I'm not a prophet, <laughs> so yeah, we have to be serious. No, maybe I have the conviction that, per se, the, the fact that these uh, vaccines in, in young children have now been made mandatory uh, are, are, is providing a kind of an electric shock to people, and that at least some of the hesitant people, not all of course, but some of the hesitant people may say, oh, well, and if the communication around it is good enough, if this is now considered to be, uh, it has to be uh, mandatory, maybe this is a serious issue and we have to listen. So actually there are some surveys which suggest that indeed that uh, to go through, uh, to an obligatory status may help, uh, which is uh, uh, in terms of raising the trust, which is, could be a little bit counterintuitive. But there are some indications that it could be the case. So that's an optimistic message, but still we have to see, and uh, it is extremely important, as you said very well, that uh, this status is uh, well accompanied by explanation, information, and uh, communication. Just one uh, last, last question. One, yes. So when <coughs> communicating, you talked about the mm. category of people that are rational, and some are irrational most often because there's a social <laughs> pressure. And then, so how do you communicate to build trust? Do you say everything you know about the vaccines, or you only address the specific factors that drive hesitancy? Mm -hmm. So. My answer to this question is what's standing between you and drinks, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, I've got you. <laughs> Unless you just start walking out of it, of black people. Um, I didn't say that. Uh, what I was trying to say was our decisions are influenced. Um, we have two pathways for the way that we make decisions. One, one is more rational and one is less rational. Okay, there are different ways of looking at it, but. Um, I think Kahneman's description of System 1 and System 2 is very good. These two systems are in play with every decision that we make. And so the rational decisions that we make essentially um, are hard work. 
So, you know, most of our energy expenditure goes on up here. This is the most expensive organ in our body in terms of energy. And so... The immune system is not bad too. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> and he's doing, doing a good job too. <laughs> you see a lot of energy. <laughs> but that means that um, because it's so costly for us, it means that we have developed um, uh, what we call... Um, heuristics, cognitive biases, to limit that expenditure when, when we can. Because if we were to make a rational decision with every single decision that we make in our day, we'd be absolutely <coughs> exhausted. And so these cognitive biases are ways of us um, limiting our expenditure to the big decisions that we have to make. And at the same time, even when we think we're being rational, there are other things at play. And as I said, the starting point for my understanding was cognitive biases, which are very interesting. But there are much, uh, there are other things going on. We will defend our beliefs till the end. So, um, I mean, I say this when in the training sessions that we have, when you say to someone, your facts are wrong, people hear, your beliefs are wrong. Even if they should be hearing, your facts are wrong, often. Okay? Especially if we're challenging something like vaccination, which may form part of their, of their identity, of their worldview of, of themselves. So the answer is uh, not simple, but it is to understand what's behind people's um, uh, understanding of vaccines and to help answer their questions in a way that um, <coughs> is always <coughs> rational. And so the bedrock of that must be sustaining trust through the conversation. Because if you lose trust, it doesn't matter how well you answer the questions rationally. Does that answer your question? Are we closer to drinks? I think so. I think it's No, I think this is here. Yeah. some battles that we shouldn't fight. But what I've been trying to say through this um, session is what you need to do is reframe vaccination in a way that fits within people's beliefs and values and view of the world. And it's not their fault if the way that they hear things doesn't fit within their world. It's our fault for not doing things better. Just as it's our fault if we don't have better vaccines for new diseases. Let's take them at the final words. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.